Welcome to episode 29 of the Various and Sundry podcast. I am your host, Matt Harmon, joined from the beautiful campus in Winona Lake, Indiana, of Grace College and Theological Seminary, by my co-host, my good friend, my co-worker, and the man who is brought to tears by Mets baseball, John Sloat. Yeah, th- those are all factually true. Yeah. We, we, we try to keep it factually true on the podcast yeah, here. As, as close to factually true as we can. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we want a correspondent reality we, at, we at some we, level. We, we, we want to try, <laughs> uh, you know. But uh, if you'd like to reach out to the podcast, you can do that on Twitter at VNSPod. You can connect by email, various and sundry podcast at gmail.com. And our Facebook page, you can connect with us there, Various and Sundry Podcast. We would love for you to leave a glowing five-star rating and review on Mm -hmm. the podcast app if you so aren't so inclined. If you so choose. Now, I I think what really matters is the five stars and that you'd write a review. It can be a so-so review. We're we're open to that. But it needs to be five stars, Just, just to be clear. You realize eventually someone's going to be snarky and throw a four-star at us just to be contrarian. Yeah, we'll cancel them. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. We did have a new review this past week, and so we want to uh, express our gratitude for that. Jordan on Main, I believe. Yeah, Jordan on Main, indeed. So we are uh, pushing through. We're a little more than halfway through July, two-thirds of the way through July. Yeah, how many weeks till school gets back for us? I think we've got four left. Okay. Right. Are you ready for the semester? No. Okay, what does it look like for you to get ready for a semester? Um, there's there's generally a period of lament over the summer over being the summer. Yeah. gone. Um, typically, that starts to happen when I get to um, my birthday. So my birthday is at the end of July. Okay. And that's kind of the hinge point for me of once my birthday comes and goes, it's like, okay, summer's basically done. We need to really hunker down and get ready for the fall. Yeah. And of course, you know, we have our plans as to what the fall looks like here at Grace in terms of restarting school. But, you know, obviously it's hard to know what's, what that's going to actually look like and whether that is actually going to be the plan given who knows what happens with the virus and such so yeah it's been a it's been a weird summer in that regard it just feels like we've continued to have meetings that we normally only have during the school year because we're trying to figure out yeah what does covid look like yeah what does it look like to do school with covid you know um will the numbers go down will they go up what does that mean for us all those things. All those things. But So it's been a weird summer. All it's that, been all bizarre that yeah. for everybody, I'm sure. But uh, we want to invite you as our listeners to participate in our Q&A episode. We are hoping that we have the necessary critical mass for this uh, to do an episode probably or hoping maybe mid-August to kind of do a Q&A episode. Yeah, as you and I are in the throes of getting used to a new routine – you know, having something ready to go for for podcasting would be would be lovely. I think we have when you say five to seven questions, yeah, somewhere in the there. hopper right now. Yeah, we'd like a few more, so please hit us up on our Facebook page, Twitter page, or just send us an email or direct message one of us on either Facebook or Twitter, and we'd be happy to consider your question. That's right, and um, the questions can be all over the place. I mean, after all, we are the various and sundry podcast. And That's so right. it could be something that is very lighthearted and humorous. It could be a theological question you have. It could be, uh, you name it, a sports question. It could be in, involved in there as well. You, you could ask a question about John Sloat's grass growing habits, and we'd consider it at least. The habits of my grass growing? Yeah, like Hmm. what your actual approach to grass growing is, the routine. Yeah, it's a sad existence. I mean, mean, that's a sad question, but we can can cover it if they want. Yeah. Uh, You know, we want to give the listeners what they want, right? So, well, this is our third week of discussing gentle and lowly. And if you haven't had a chance to pick up the book yet and you're like, well, I'm kind of so-so, I'm enjoying having... John and Matt talk about it, but I haven't picked it up myself. I'd really encourage you to pick it up. I think it's probably one of the better books 
in the last decade that I've picked up. Um, so I'd encourage you to grab it as soon as possible. Yes. And uh, so this week we are going to talk about uh, just observations and thoughts from, uh, I think it's chapter 17 through 23, basically the last third of the book uh, when it comes to things that struck us. And so I don't know, John, if you want, you want to get us kicked off here in terms of what 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 caught your attention in these last six or seven chapters here? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll, I could mention a lot of things, but but certainly from his chapter, Rich in Mercy, yeah, um, was I, I think a very very good chapter. Uh, he kind of pulls that in from Ephesians chapter two, yep. uh, talking about we're dead in sin, uh, the gift of grace, but the motivation for that is God is rich in mercy. Yeah, um, and he makes the point, and and I guess I never thought about this before, but he makes the point that. It is mercy is the only thing that God is described as being rich in mm-hmm. that uh, that God that, that that it's central to His being that that um, He overflows uh, with this mercy um, and a, a couple of a couple of quotes um, that I enjoyed he he said at one point uh, because mercy is who He is He is being rich in mercy His heart gushes forth mercy to sinners one and all. Um, mm-hmm. One of the things I, I really enjoyed, and then uh, also in his conversation of uh, "we're dead in our trespasses and sin," which immediately precedes that uh, section, he says, and and uh, this really caught my attention. Christ was not sent to mend wounded people, or to wake sleepy people, or advise confused people, or inspire bored people, or spur on lazy people, or educate ignorant people. But to raise dead people, mm-hmm. and that uh, that was a bit uh, that was a bit chilling as I read it. Yeah, um, and that was it was uh, quite good. Um, and you enjoyed that chapter as well, didn't you? I did. In fact, when we came in studio, yes, and we had our initial <laughs> discussion of so what what do you want to highlight? Um, you said that, and I said rats. Because that's that's exactly what I wanted to highlight. But the great thing is there's there's so much so much good stuff in here that it's not difficult for me to to pick something else uh, out. And so uh, when you look at uh, chapter twenty, uh, he's entitled it "Our Law-ish Hearts, His Lavish Heart," and uh, I really appreciate one of the opening. A uh, couple lines here of the of the of the chapter, where he says on page one eighty one, the battle of the Christian life is to bring your own heart into alignment with Christ's. That is, getting mm. up each morning and replacing your natural orphan mindset with a mindset of full and free adoption into the family of God through the work of Christ, your older brother, who loved you and gave himself for you out of the overflowing fullness of his gracious heart. And I know that resonates with my own experience of needing to daily remind myself of the gospel and God's grace and God's mercy that there is often those sort of initial thoughts when you wake up in the morning. <laughs> and and even I experience this when I'm going to bed at night and just reflecting on areas where I've fallen short of loving hmm. God and loving others to the extent that I'm called to and easily slipping into that feeling of discouragement or, um, or frustration and having to be reminded and to remind myself of God's lavish love for me. And Hmm. it doesn't rest on my performance. And that's, that's, that's a tricky one for me because I'm a, I'm a pretty performance driven person. Really? Um, PhD, (laughs) all these things. (laughs) I know. Uh, wow! Breaking news. Spoiler alert. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, exactly. So, um, I was greatly ministered to by by that quote, that chapter, uh, and he goes on to talk about uh, kind of walking through Galatians and unpacking that theme. And um, obviously, Galatians is something that's near and dear to my own heart. Yeah, you're familiar with that a little bit. Yeah, um, and yet I need the message of it just as much every day. So, um, we are. Uh, so we so this concludes our sort of segment discussion of gentle and lowly, but we are absolutely thrilled 
that next week history will be made yeah. on the podcast. <laughs> we will air our interview with Dane Orland. The the author of the, author of the of book Gentle we've been and discussing. Lowly. And it's a good one. He's a good interview. Yeah, he was, oh my goodness, so good, so gracious, th- so uh, passionate and yeah. inspiring as, as you work your way through this. And he's he really feels like Gentle and Lowly is a message that, that really needs to get out there. And that, yeah. was, that was exciting to see. And just to be clear, even if you have not read the book, you will still enjoy the interview. Absolutely. And so um, don't be tempted to think, well, I've not read the book. And uh, no, no, no. You want to hear what Dane has to say. And if you haven't read the book at that point, and then you hear Dane talk about it, I'd be stunned if you didn't want to read the book yeah. after hearing him talk about it. So uh, I want to encourage you to make sure you catch that next episode, which will be episode 30. Wow. Episode 30. Wow. So 30 straight weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Lord willing. I mean, this is, we're, we're still on 29. This we're week. still on 29 right now. Yeah. <laughs> But um, we we should at least check in on the world of sports. John, what's what's going on in the world of sports? Yeah, the, the big news is Major League Baseball begins Thursday with two games on ESPN, and then uh, the rest of everybody else picks up Friday. So two days from when we're recording here is when Major League Baseball will start. and um, It's a very exciting time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I understand that it was uh, a very emotional experience for you to watch oh, some, my. Spring, some so-called spring training baseball. Yeah, spring training at the end of July. Yeah. Um, but yes, uh, to turn on the Mets and hear the music and listen to the announcers that I love um, was, oh my goodness, it was so good. It felt like... It felt like summer finally, you know, you know, in a way to hear uh, Keith Hernandez and Ron Darling and uh, the, those guys uh, begin to talk about begin to talk about baseball. And, you know, what was what's fun is the Mets have begun to sell seats um, and you can put a cardboard cutout of yourself. You can you can make a donation, oh I think, to the gosh. Mets Foundation and you could put a cardboard cutout of yourself back there. And so behind home plate is really where they filled up right now. And people have like, you know, pictures of themselves or, or, or a beloved family member that loves the Mets. Yeah. Somebody put their dog back there. So there's just a picture of a dog back there. I mean, it's it's a lot of fun. Um, so, yeah, it was it was good to see that. And then one of the one of the crazy things. So the Mets played the Yankees, obviously, because they're, you know, like 11 miles apart. And uh, so the first night they were in uh, City Field, the Mets Stadium. The broadcasters were there broadcasting. And then the next night, they were in Yankee Stadium up in the Bronx. Well, the Mets broadcasters were still broadcasting from City Field. And so they said they had all these monitors set up to watch the game. Uh-huh. And they would they would see something happen on the monitor and instinctively look to the field that had no lights on it, was just pitch black. <laughs> and they're like, we can't stop doing it. We have to look at the field, you know. Yeah. Um, just because they've uh, worn such patterns of of doing yeah. that, so yeah, it's exciting to have some live sports back, and uh, hopefully rooting for uh, health first of all, but second for yeah. uh, for a good season. Yeah. Now i I sent you a link this week. Yeah. About how they're handling some crowd noise. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, it, and I haven't seen it anywhere else other than I believe it was Darren Ravel's tweet. Is yeah. that right? where he mentioned that you'll be able to log into an MLB app and you'll be able to hit cheer or boo um, for, mm-hmm. for this or for that, uh, and it'll be pumped into the stadium at, at some yeah, level. Yeah, I guess. Um, well, they'll, they'll take the aggregate maybe and yeah. push it in there, which could be really exciting, but could be a lot of spammers uh, as well. <laughs> yes. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that works out because uh, I I have seen some soccer, some Premier League soccer, where they pump in crowd noise. And uh, I'm not a huge soccer fan, but I I will say it seemed to work because the field is so big that the camera just captures what's on the field. Mm -hmm. So you don't really see the empty stands very much. And so it feels normal in terms of you're used to seeing just the field and not necessarily uh, the crowd reactions, but with a sport like baseball, baseball you see the fans you see a lot. The fans, you see the stands, and so it'll be interesting to see how that how that works from a viewing experience kind of. 
Yeah, um, and I, I do know that um, they had the Baltimore riots a number of years ago, and they played an empty game at Camden Yards, and um, they didn't have crowd noise there. And one of the reasons they're doing crowd noise is so that you cannot hear what's going on in the other dugout, which was a problem at the Camden Yards game. Yeah. So um, I think it's for the players also, but also for the viewing experience. Um, it's quite good. And I, I do... I saw a video of Christian Yelich going up to bat in an inner squad game and them turning on the booze so that Christian Yelich <laughs> felt at home um, when, when he was at the plate, being, nice. being one of the premier hitters in the, in the majors, Nice, which I thought was great. I'm probably going to give baseball a little bit of a try this time around. Oh, I'm so excited. But I, I don't know. I First mean. baseball, <laughs> then Hamilton. Yeah, well, no, I don't, I don't. <laughs> That took an unexpected and un- uninvited turn. There. <laughs> we can uh, talk about Hamilton at some point. Um, the the only the other things going on in sports are uh, the NBA comes back next week. Um, I think uh, end of the month, right? Thirtieth. Thirtieth. Right? Yeah. So, so it's uh, it's coming, um, and all things seem to be pointing up in the Orlando bubble. I guess, yeah. Except for the snitch line. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Though Zion Williamson did leave the bubble, from what I understand, for some sort of family... Some personal reasons, yeah. ...emergency or something. But I, I guess I'm not clear as to what the protocol then is. Like, when he comes back, is he like 14 days of quarantine or 10 days of quarantine before yeah, he I'm, can be around anybody? Like, I don't think it's 14 days. I think it's like seven or eight. Okay, so even if it's a week, though... Like, do you know if he's been if he's back yet, or is he still out of the bubble? I don't know. I, I I'm not sure. I mean, the season starts well what, in a week. It kind of mirrors the regular season, right? So the the Pelicans drafted him. They they then went, oh my goodness, let's get all these prime time games for yeah. the Pelicans, and then he was injured. Yeah. For the beginning of the season, and and you couldn't watch him. This is going to be very similar. It's like the Pelicans. Basically, were brought back because of Zion Williams. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, and and now they're going to bring him back, or they're going to they're going to put them on TV, and you're going to be watching Brandon Ingram or um, <laughs> yeah. uh, 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 Lonzo, you know, out out there playing. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's going to be it's going to mirror the beginning of the season. Yeah, which is funny. Well, our main topic for today is um, actually it's not too far out of line with. Um, what we see in Gentle and Lowly, mm-hmm. as we're going to talk about J.I. Packer. Yeah. And uh, J.I. Packer, just this past, was it Sunday, I think? Saturday, maybe, uh, passed away, went yeah. home to be with the Lord, just a few days short of his 94th birthday. Yeah. And uh, as we sort of reflected on uh, what we would want to talk about this week, it seemed like uh, this would be an opportunity to perhaps introduce some of our listeners to an individual that they may not be that familiar with, even though he's a uh, a very significant history within the, I would say, within the history of evangelicalism in the at least in the 20th century and into this century as well. Yeah, he's really been a giant um, in theological studies. Born uh, 1929, is it? Am I getting that year right? Uh, be before that, wouldn't it? If he was going to be 94 this week. Um, would have been 26. 26. So pre-World War II, the, yeah. the, the man has memories of World War II. Um, born in England, I believe, in Great Britain, correct? Yeah. yeah. And then and then eventually made his way uh, to Oxford and eventually to Canada, um, where I think he did the a majority of his writing or the majority of his adult life, I think, was mm-hmm. it was in Canada. Um and published his first book. I was doing the research yesterday. Published his first book in 1958 and his last book in 2017, which is remarkable. Yeah, that's crazy. That, that, <laughs> that's some longevity in, yeah. in the writing field. And I think retired not because of his mental ability, but because his eyesight began to go. Yeah, at the end of his life, he had more or less lost his eyesight uh, due to uh, macular degeneration. But um, it's interesting, uh, Justin Taylor has a really long article on the Gospel Coalition that gives a biographical sketch. Um, But 
one of the more interesting features of that is that at the age of seven, he was hit by a bread truck. Really? Yeah. I don't think I knew this. So age seven, he was being chased by a bully, apparently, ran out into the street and was hit by a, it's described here as a passing bread van. Hmm. <laughs> Just an, an interesting, odd uh, experience. But he ended up needing brain surgery, had a three-week hospital stay, and he had a uh, apparently a depressed compound fracture of the frontal bone on the right-hand side of his forehead. So he had to wear this, like, um, protective aluminum plate over his over the that, that part of his forehead wow and was not allowed to play sports as a young boy because of that wow yeah and and so that, amazing well you know i tend to think of like oh childhood injuries i wonder if this will affect the length of life clearly not obviously not yeah but it did have a, an interesting shaping experience to him in in terms of he uh he loved sports but it prevented him from being able to play and there's a a pretty famous story about him that on his 11th birthday he was hoping for expecting kind of a uh, as his birthday gift a um a bike but that was kind of a traditional kind of somewhat coming of age gift at around the age of 11 to get a bike and instead his parents gave him a really nice typewriter Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Which, that's a very different gift. A very, very different gift. And yeah. what's striking is that, uh, obviously, uh, at first he was quite disappointed, which you can understand an 11-year-old kid. Yeah, wanting the freedom of yeah. having a bicycle. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But instead, he eventually embraced it, and that was kind of the part of the launching of his interest in writing. Hmm. And so um, he ended up, you know, after he went to Oxford, became, uh, eventually became um, very deeply involved. He was converted, I can't remember if it was while at Oxford or maybe slightly uh, after that. But again, converted in a sort of, you know, off the radar kind of place. No, like, you know, no one at the time thought, wow, this is a huge event in the history of evangelicalism. That yeah. this kid named James, Jim, to his friends, uh, was converted. Hmm. And yet, um, as he was uh, sort of went into ministry and was um, involved in the in the Anglican Church, he uh, came to have more and more prominence. And in particular, uh, his early interests were in the Puritans, and that's in part how it kind of ties into what we we uh, have been seeing with Gentle and Lowly. Right, and I believe his dissertation even was on the Puritans, yeah. if, if memory serves. Yeah, absolutely, and that kind of began to launch him into his um, into his career in ministry in terms of writing, and um, he became very involved in, in sort of Anglican Church kind of uh, controversies and such. Was a very good close friend with Martin Lloyd Jones. Yeah, and um, together they started a Puritan conference where every year they would have this conference where people would come in and and give presentations and papers and messages on. The Puritans. Hmm. No, it's so fascinating. I, I, you can make the argument that contemporary evangelicals who are interested in the Puritans are interested because of Jim Packer. Hmm. That if he had not, he and Martin Lloyd Jones had Jones had not um, been so invested in them and popularized them, that the Puritans would not be nearly as popular as they are today among evangelicals. Interesting. Hmm. And so now. If memory serves, and I, I don't know if you want to speak to this, they they had a bit of a falling out at some point. They did, yes. So uh, when you look at the life of of Packer, he was involved in a few different points of controversy along the way. One of them was on developments within the Anglican Church, mm-hmm. and I'm no expert in in that field. So my understanding is that essentially. As there were these the ongoing rift of the more liberal bent and embracing um, cultural sensitivities, and then there was the conservative strain within the Anglican Church, represented by Martin Lloyd Jones. 
Packer tried to be somewhat of a middleman, a peacemaker to try to keep things together. And oftentimes what happens in those contexts is the guy stuck in the middle just takes fire from everybody. Sure. And so um, Lloyd-Jones eventually just felt like Packer was trying to give too much away to Mm. the liberal contingent within the Anglican Church. And they had a very serious falling out where um, they stopped doing the Puritan Conference and their friendship was deeply strained. And that probably in part helped lead to Packer leaving England and relocating in Canada, Mm -hmm. which was good for Canada. It was great for Canada (laughs) and North America. And North America, yeah. It did help raise his profile, I think, a little bit in North America when he moved to Canada. But um, I think that... You know his writing ministry is what's going to live on. Yeah. So, what are some what are some key texts of his that we should that we should know about and perhaps even pick up and and read a little bit? Well, if you're going to read one book by uh, J.I. Packer, it should be Knowing God. That, okay. That's the classic. It was published the year I was born, 1973. And um, now we can all figure out your age. There you go. Yeah. And you can, um, you know, it, it is one of those classic books of Christian devotional literature Hmm. that uh, I think Don Carson in his tribute to Packer said essentially, you know, if Christ delays another 200 years, people will still be reading Knowing God 200 Hmm. years from now. Wow. Which is, you know, no small feat to say. But I I read it as a college student. And so, um, in fact, my copy is the 20th anniversary edition. So that would have put, you know, put it right, right in the middle of my college years. And it was, it was transforming in my mm. understanding of who God is. And uh, there's so much in there. And it was even fun to go back in the last couple of days and look at my copy that I read in college and see my markings and notes <laughs> and that sort of thing. Um, but... Uh, I mean, his chapter on the wrath of God, which you wouldn't think would would be the most compelling read, was amazing. Really? Because he talks about propitiation, about the Mm. heart of the gospel of God satisfying his wrath Mm. through his son Jesus. And that's that's the heart of the gospel, that if you don't understand the wrath of God, then you don't necessarily understand the work of Christ and how that's fundamental to Mm. the gospel. But um, for me— the, the the probably the best part of this was his chapter on adoption hmm. because in here he talks about how um, adoption is the highest blessing of the gospel that justification is the primary blessing of the gospel that sinners are declared not guilty but it's still the legal realm sure sure there's not the personal there's aspect. not the personal aspect adoption is family language hmm. it's being brought into God's family. There's a there's an intimacy. A judge doesn't necessarily have to have any sort of personal relationship with a a, a defendant. In fact, the expectation is they don't. Right. They remain unbiased. Yeah. Right. But when it comes to the gospel, adoption is God bringing a person into the family. So hmm. that was very transformative for me. Um, what about you? Have you... Read. I know you haven't read a ton of Packer. But I haven't read. A, I haven't read Knowing God, which I which I feel like I need to repent of on the podcast <laughs> or something. Um, but uh, but I, I've read a little bit. I think I think when when I was coming of age, a little bit more um, in my theological reading. I think Packer was a bit older, was publishing mm-hmm. less, and I yep. think was a bit less prominent. Um, I always knew Packer as the blurb guy, yeah. right? That that. That any any book that was being published in evangelicalism, Packer was giving his his stamp of approval to yeah. uh, in in some form or fashion. Um, what I did read of his was evangelism uh, and the sovereignty of God, which was a which was a classic, which was a great great read um, and and super helpful at at nailing down how how do we you know you know kind of the, kind of the pushback on oh God's sovereign why evangelize you know right. you know if God yeah. knows you know. Um, and he brings those two together and shows not just how they coexist, but how they work together, yep. um, which I found very, very helpful. And it's not a very long book. It's only like 100, 120 pages. It's yeah. really short. It's it's not a very long book at all. But super readable and accessible. Mm-hmm. And that, that's part of the genius of Packer is that he was, in the best sense of this term, a popularizer. Hmm. He was able to take 
complex and, and difficult ideas and topics and explain them in a way that a broad audience could understand. And so I think that's one of his greatest legacies. In fact, he wrote a book called Concise Theology. I've recommended that to students on, an, on a number of occasions, yeah. Which is arguably the shortest sort of systematic theology book you'll ever find. And it's you know, it has these entries where it's, you know, it'll have, it, it'll have a chapter on justification that's like two pages, <laughs> two and a half, with littered with scriptural references and a clear definition. Sure. But it is a great tool to give somebody, even especially a young believer, and say, okay, if you hear all these like theology terms, like this is a great resource to go to. And what does justification mean? Yeah. What does adoption refer to? What is... Um, what does it mean that God is a, is is Trinity? And mm-hmm. The 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 simple and clear explanations are a great starting point. It's it is a regular reference that I will check I will check into in terms of what's a good concise definition of yeah. this term that's even, not going to be just, overloaded. Even just to give you a baseline, yeah, um, absolutely. With, without going, you know, into in, into the super deep theology, yeah, so, absolutely, yeah, and. Um, Based on his interest in the Puritans, he wrote a book uh, that uh, you actually, actually have sitting right there in front of you called yeah. The Quest for Godliness. Which I, I think by Providence, uh, T4G gave away uh, this year. That's how yeah. um, I got my new copy. I had an older copy. I have not read it, um, but I'm you know, uh, hearing so much about him and mm-hmm. uh, seeing all the articles written about him. I think I'm going to uh, give it a read in the next uh, several weeks. Yeah. So, so a, a good introduction to the Puritans and the and how they help us with the spiritual life. Mm-hmm. Um, I, my favorite, my favorite book title of okay. anything that J.I. Packer wrote. I was going to bring this up because you, we have it on the sheet here. Yeah. yeah. Had you, you heard of this? I, I had not. I, when I was doing some research <laughs> yesterday on J.I. Packer, I came across it and I was like, we probably need to talk about this. Have you read it? I have not. Okay, okay. It's, the, the title of the book is, is Hot Tub Religion. yeah. Any idea what it's about? It's about the effects of materialism on the church. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the dude wrote, and again, if you see any pictures of this guy, he's the last guy you'd ever expect to write a book that's entitled Hot Tub Religion. Yeah. Like if Mark Driscoll had written a book called Hot Tub Religion, you'd have been like, yeah, Makes sense. That makes sense. Yep. That makes sense. Or even someone like a, like a Matt Chandler or a Stephen Furtick, someone who's a little bit edgier, more contemporary. Mm-hmm. This is J.I. Packer, who in eight, 1987, when it came out, he would have been like 60 years old. He's like, yeah, yeah, it's like <laughs> something like 15 years after he wrote uh, wrote uh, Knowing yeah. God. Yeah, he chooses to write a book called Hot Tub Religion. Yeah, it's fantastic. That's what, what a title! What a title! Um, if you're interested in, um, there are a couple of biographies out there. I have read. The one by Leland Riken, published in 2015, called J.I. Packer, An Evangelical Life. Yeah, Leland's a good author. Very I enjoy good. his writing. Yeah. And uh, Sam Storms wrote a book mm. called Packer on the Christian Life. So that's uh, part of the series that Crossway does where they take a key theologian and they give a little bit of a biographical sketch, but then talk about their approach to the Christian life and what we learn about the Christian life from them. So that's uh, Sam Storms. Packer and the Christian Life are on the Christian Life, and uh, we'll have links to these books uh, in the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, I I think that as I reflect on the life of and ministry of J.I. Packer, um, I do have one story. It's kind of a sad story. Oh, my, my yeah! Near, you told my, me this last my, night. My yeah. near my my near brush with with J.I. Packer. So. Uh, J.I. Packer was the general editor for a Bible study series that's called Knowing the Bible. And it's published by Crossway. It's a series of 12-week Bible studies on each book of the Bible. And you wrote? Jeremiah. That's right, Jeremiah. And so um, I had heard another contributor to the series, I can't remember who it was, make uh, a comment about having J.I. Packer's handwritten notes Mm -hmm. about as part of the editorial process sure. about his contribution. 
And when I heard that, I instantly thought, I have to see if I can get mine, right? I have to see if I can get the Absolutely. handwritten notes. You got to get your hands on G.I. Packers. That G.I. Yep. Packer wrote after reading through my, my Bible study. So I approached Crossway, and they said, well, look into it. And they got back to me and said, we're so sorry. We cannot find them. <sighs> they must have been lost in this. Apparently there was some move that took place in at Crossway in terms of files or things like that, and those are no more, or they can't find them. <sighs> That's so sad. I was crestfallen. Uh, oh. Those would have been great. Oh, it would have been so good, but yeah. in any case. But... Uh, one of the interesting articles that was uh, put out by the Gospel Coalition was um, Matt Smethers put out a list of 40 quotes from J. From, from J. I. Packer, but there was a quote that you wanted to highlight in light of our discussion last episode uh, that was mentioned at the end of the um, Justin Taylor sort of tribute that is like 15 pages long here. My goodness. Yeah, and I think they did a brief documentary on him uh, not not that long ago. Yeah, um, it, it's got uh, video clips and interviews and that sort of stuff, so there's plenty of things out there. But, uh, but they asked him the question, how do you want to be remembered when you're yeah. gone? Um, obviously interviewing toward the end of his life. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and one of the things he said, he said a number of things, but one of the things he says, I should like to be remembered as someone who is always courteous in controversy, but without compromise. Yeah. And I thought that, I thought that, was, a, that was a great quote uh, in the midst of what we were just talking about last week, right? Yep. Being gracious uh, with those you disagree with, um, yeah. being courteous in controversy, um, but, not, but not compromising your beliefs or, or, or what, you, uh, what you stand for. Yeah. It's... Uh, a needed, a needed reminder mm-hmm. in our increasingly polarized culture and context where it seems like you just don't see that kind of disagreement modeled. I mean, you know, we were having this conversation last night after uh, our reading group about how uh, our students at Grace often have not seen gracious disagreement. Mm-hmm. Um, they've only seen, you know, bombs being lobbed back and forth on social media and not seen people who genuinely and sincerely disagree and have firmly and deeply held convictions about contentious issues who can have a conversation mm-hmm. and not end up not having it end up in name calling and vitriol and um, very being very heated and and. It heated in a in a bad sense. Yeah, there, there's got to be a category for robust disagreement um, and kindness. You know, you know, bringing those two things together. Yeah. And yeah, it seems like everything just gets cast as such a zero sum game. Like I either get everything I want or I get nothing. Yeah, and you know, Packer was not immune to criticism, both on the discussion we had about Anglin- Anglicanism, and he caught heat for his involvement in the in discussions between evangelicals and Catholics about yeah. trying to come to some measure of agreement on what is the gospel. And uh, even the tribute written by Don Carson essentially acknowledges that he was kind of stuck in the middle, but you can tell by the way Carson kind of writes sure. it. He said he basically, he himself had criticisms of, of Packer for some of the things that he said and did in that in that context. Yeah, he really tried to be a, a, a peacemaker yeah. um, and was incredibly ecumenical. And uh, and took some took some arrows for it. Absolutely. So, um, but this is a great opportunity for us to acknowledge our own personal gratitude for the life and ministry of J. I. Packer, and to uh, to recognize the the finishing of the race by a faithful servant. Yeah, and uh, just an encouragement. I, I know we have a number of college students that are out there listening. Um, if you've never heard of J.I. Packer, he's incredibly readable. Yes. Go pick up some books. Uh, read some J.I. Packer. It's going to give you a great entry point into discussion. Yes. And he is he is uh, he will also whet your appetite for the Puritans as well. Yeah. So, yeah. In any case, we are at episode twenty nine, and so twenty nine. Let's talk about our athletes. Yeah. Um, so uh, 
Do you want me to work our way through the, yeah, through sure. the list here? Okay. Um, Eric Dickerson, uh, the great Rams running back. Uh, started with the Colts, didn't he? Did he? I think he started with the Colts and then was traded to the Rams. Okay, but he was... More primarily more, with the Rams. Yeah, and I think had his record-breaking season. That's correct. Um, with yep. the Rams. Uh, Satchel Paige, uh, the baseball player. Great pitcher in the Negro Leagues. Yes. Uh, back before baseball allowed black players, he there was an entire, dis- entirely distinct baseball league made up of African American players, and he was absolutely legendary in that. Not he did eventually though. Did he not eventually play in the major leagues after there was integration? I think at the tail end, the very end of his career. Yeah. I think. Yeah, and I think. When they were talking about bringing up black players, I think he was on the list, but they went, he's too old. We need somebody young who's going to be here for a long time. And, and so they went with Jackie. Jackie. Robbins. Yeah. Um, Rod Carew. Yeah, great hitter from the uh, from the 80s. Uh, played for the Angels and some other teams okay. in there as well. Uh, John Smoltz. Great pitcher for the Braves. Uh, yeah, close. And Tigers, right? You pitch for Maybe I think he started with the Tigers, and they got rid of or traded him. Perhaps, but I, what John Smoltz is known for is he was a fantastic starter. Yeah, and then at some point the Braves didn't need him to be a starter, so he became a closer. Yeah, he was a dominant closer, and then he went back to being a starter after that. And now I think he's one of the better broadcasters. Yeah, out there. yeah, absolutely. Um, and then do you want to do you want to lead in the Ohio State player here? I'd be honored to. Okay, so. Because uh, I don't know who that is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, our, our Ohio State um, athlete for this episode is Pepe Pearson. I do name. love the name. Yeah. <laughs> he's, great. he's a running back. Pepe. Pepe. Like you expect, you know, that that you know that kind of sounds like Pepe. You know, you're thinking somebody who's really fast. And so he was a he was a very good, not great, but a very good mm. running back for Ohio State uh, in the mid nineties. Greatly overshadowed by some guy named Eddie George. Who? Eddie George. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and the, there's a jet player I'd like to highlight here. Okay. Yeah, go uh, for it. Bilal Powell. <laughs> okay, tell me about Bilal. Is that Bilal Powell? Is a he's recently played for the Jets last okay. four or five years. Um, I think this is his first year not on the Jets. I'm not quite sure where he landed, but Louisville uh, product. Okay, um, running back. All right, and. Uh, and has been was was very very good 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 pass catcher and uh, and good runner between the tackles. Okay, Bilal Powell. Bilal, what a name! Yeah, Bilal name. Powell, number twenty nine. So, do you have a do you have a leaning, a preference, an inclination, a bent? Okay, so I have three. <laughs> okay, Eric Dickerson, Satchel Paige, John Smoltz would be the th- would be the three that I'd be most comfortable with. Okay, of the five, we, six, I guess we have. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with those three. And um, I do you have a, a leaning among those three? I remember John Smoltz as a pitcher, and I think I recency biased. I remember him. I'm probably more apt to go with him. But I know Eric Dickerson had a phenomenal career, and Satchel Paige has a good story. So I, I could go— I. I really could go any of those any of those ways. So, yeah, yeah. That I feel like this this is a tough one this week because um, uh, uh, similar things that you said there. I think all three of those athletes are historically notable. Yes, that in the respective histories of their sports, you really can't effectively tell the history of that sport without at least mentioning. Mm-hmm. You know, Eric Dickerson. I think was he. I mean, he broke the NFL rushing record for single season. Single season, yep. Uh, was just a, an amazing running back. And he's probably, I don't know, I haven't looked at the stats, but probably top 10 all time at least, maybe top five in terms of rushing yards. I think so, at least top time. 10, yeah. But um, I, I read somewhere that he can't, for, for his first two years out of the league, he had to sleep in a recliner because his body just hurt yeah. so much. I mean, just he was he was just a really interesting taste, uh, test case and— what happens to the yeah. NFL running back's body? I'm willing to, uh, despite that, I'm willing to eliminate him. <sighs> okay. Tough. I know. We, we've gone with running backs. We have. We, we've had a string of which, I mean, it makes sense for the numbers, right? 
So I'm willing to drop it down to either Satchel Page or John Spoltz, and I'm going to put the burden on you oh. to select. Um, let's go Satchel Page. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad you picked that. That's who yeah. I really want. <laughs> <laughs> let's go but, Satchel but, Page. But not enough to fight for it. So yeah. in any case, um, one thing we liked. Yeah, so uh, for me, my one thing I like this week, and I'll put this on Twitter uh, later, but um, my mom sent me an email probably two weeks ago, and it, it contained two pages of a memoir uh, my great uncle Alan wrote, who was my grandfather's older brother. Um, and in this, uh, they capture the story of my uh, great grandfather, so uncle, great uncle Alan's dad, uh, of him uh, growing up in Pennsylvania or him being an adult in Pennsylvania, and basically uh, being in this shop, buying some goods, uh, and, an, and, a, and a black man comes in and tries to purchase something, and the shop owner goes, how dare you come in here with a, with a white man buying something? Mm-hmm. And my, my great-grandfather looks at uh, the shopkeeper and basically says, like, his money is as good as mine. Um, the shopkeeper did not like this cheek and took a swing at him. Um, and from what I gather, my great grandfather dodged it and then floored him, like just just leveled him. Uh, nice. The marshal showed up and and took my great my great grandfather to jail. Um, had a ten dollar bail placed, which was uh, in in the memoir it says two weeks pay, which wow, feels like a lot. Yeah. Um, and so he obviously can't afford it. Uh, and the black man from the store came and bailed him out. Um, hmm. of, of jail, paid his bail, uh, basically. And then, uh, and then um, the story actually fast forwards uh, to a few years later, uh, probably 10, 15 years later, uh, my grandfather has now been born. And Ed Hawkins, a black man, moves in across the street. Uh, and the neighborhood, neighborhood is freaking out that a, that a black family is moving in. Mm-hmm. And my, grandfather goes, my great-grandfather goes over, introduces himself, uh, invites him over for dinner, strikes up a wonderful friendship uh, with this family. Uh, and they even hint, he even hints that my grandfather uh, would go over there and, and get food regularly from Mrs. Hawkins. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll post that cool. on, on Twitter uh, probably this evening sometime. It's a, it's a very cool story, yeah. uh, very exciting to see. How about awesome. yourself? Well, mine is uh, far less historically significant. Mine is um, this past week or so um the happy rant podcast that uh, you and i both are big fans of we enjoy immensely regular listeners yeah and um they posted segment like episode length interviews with each of the individuals there's three men who are part of this podcast and each they each have interesting backstories Hmm. you have barnabas piper son of john piper so he's interviewed for like 45 minutes to 50 minutes about what it was like to grow up in, you know, as the son of John Piper. Fascinating stuff. Ted Cluck, he wrote a book with Kevin DeYoung on uh, why we're not emergent. Uh, He's a big sports fan. He has just interesting life history as well. And then Ronnie Martin is, uh, he was uh, one of the key guys in a band called, was it Joy Electric, I think? I'm not sure. I haven't listened to that From the mid-90s, one. like hmm. kind of elect- electric, kind of synthesized music. And so stories from the road of <laughs> being in the Christian music industry in the 90s, which were interesting. So just enjoyed that a lot this week. But, well, are we, are we ready to call Mission Accomplished? <sighs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah I, think, I think we've done it. And uh, as we wind down, we do want to remind you, next episode, The Interview with Dane Orland, author of Gentle and Lowly. We are very excited. We've already recorded it. We know you'll love it. So please make sure you check that out. And so uh, until next time, the Lord bless y'all real good. Later. Later.